Uh, the first title, of course, is employment. The second title is state and local governmental services. I spent about a year and a half, a year ago, traveling around the state of Alabama, looking at state prisons to interview inmates and to examine inmates from death row down to medium security, hundreds and hundreds of inmates, to try to understand and make sense of why these institutions were so resistant to accommodations and resistant to, I would say, humane, you know, it's one thing to incarcerate somebody. It's another thing to torture people. And why were the conditions so compellingly not good for inmates with disabilities? Why was there no systematic plan for accessibility? Why was there no systematic way in which people with cognitive disabilities, physical disabilities, could request accommodations or grieve those accommodations? Why were individuals with mental disabilities, cognitive disabilities, and other disabilities summarily excluded from folk rehab reentry programs, program educational programs, because they didn't have accessible versions, that would enhance their ability to reenter society and achieve parole? Now, Alabama was a very special case. Uh, this case was organized by the Alabama PNA and by the Southern Poverty Law Center, two fantastic organizations that I was very privileged to play a small part to work with. Um, interestingly, I don't know what the case is here. In Alabama, the census for African American males in the state is 12%. What do you think the census was for African American males incarcerated? Any guesses? 60 to 70%. So it tells you that there are terrific other issues of poverty, race, a failure of the educational system. Many of these individuals who were incarcerated really had no IEPs, no special education supports. And you could almost predict, you know, what was going to happen in a sad way. And, and I've had that case also in South Carolina in a case called Alexander S. B. Boyd. It was the first case under the Americans with Disabilities Act to try to understand why there was a terrific failure of educational services in juvenile justice facilities. Why the vast majority of, of kids in juvenile justice facilities would just roll into adult facilities, why there was really no out. So through the Southeast ADA, which Barry will tell you about, where we regularly interact with prisoners and others and get comments, we really take a hard look at these kind of systemic variables, these systemic factors that drive these terrific inequalities and in disability. Now, the, the, my hope, by the way, today is to talk for a while, then I want to introduce Barry and Laura, and then I want to be as engaged as possible with you guys. The other area which uh, the Burton Blatt Institute, there are two other areas I want to talk about, uh, is um, web accessibility. In the, in oh, around the year 2000, I was very fortunate to act as co-counsel pro bono uh, in a case called the National Federation of the Blind versus Target Stores. Today it's a little different, people have kind of come around, but then, um, there was great resistance to accommodations in terms of websites. As a matter of fact, before this case, um, it actually was around the time of the Clinton impeachment hearings. I remember that because I was testifying before Congress. I had been requested to testify before Congress on the issue of whether or not the Americans with Disabilities Act covered websites, that they had to be accessible. And the chairman of the committee that I was testifying before somehow was Henry Hyde, of the Judiciary Constitutional Committee. He was the guy that was leading the Clinton uh, impeachment proceedings. And uh, I'll never forget that. They were kind of grilling me. And under the ADA, as you know, um, places of public accommodation, hotels, restaurants, convention centers are covered by the law. My position was that the word place was broad enough to include cyber places. And this, of course, is a lawyer's dream to open up, which I did, the Oxford English Dictionary, 
and proceed to read the definition of place into the congressional record and then argue why place and this, you know, this was a, actually turned out to be a very important argument, not just by me, but by many others, um, why it was so crucial that this new cyber venue be covered. Why? Because people with, who were blind, deaf, uh, learning disabilities were being excluded by the thousands, tens of thousands from this venue. So when the NFB versus Target case came along, uh, Target stores, you know, everybody knows Target, like Walmart, for some reason, they didn't want to be told by the government that they had to make their website accessible. They subsequently did. And they realized, well, do we want to exclude tens of thousands of people that will then go to Walmart or somewhere else because they can't use our web? And it, it, it was actually, we, we prevailed in that case. It was the first case of its kind. But what was nice about that was the lead plaintiff was a kid named Bruce Sexton, who was a, a junior or senior at Cal at the time, Berkeley. And today, who's, he's blind. Bruce Sexton is my research assistant, a third year law student who has done a lot of things in his life, but is now wants to give back and wants to be part of the next generation of lawyers to fight for these issues. Interestingly, uh, the subsequent case that we had in this arena, and again, these cases all go to this rub that I'm talking about, this resistance to considering disability as an element of diversity and also that can add value. Um, the subsequent case, case, interestingly, was a case I was involved with representing, again, pro bono lawyer, uh, GLAD, the Greater Los Angeles Association for the Death, Deaf, uh, thousands of people in California against CNN. Kind of surprising at that time, CNN was not captioning its video clips on the web, which excluded tens of thousands of people who were deaf, basically, from watching CNN. Interestingly, many other organizations still do that. Even my university had to have a fight a couple of years ago to make sure there was captioning the head signer, but captioning for commencement exercises, for example. Any video we put up, from my point of view, that's contemporary, better be accessible to screen reader software and to captioning and so forth. So anyway, CNN, again, lawyers being lawyers, there are lawyers in the room, had a very creative argument. We said that um, there's no question that the California state law should cover the web, in this case, captions for hearing impaired, um, and that this was a violation of the law because it was not accessible. CNN came back with the argument, interesting lawyers, you know, strong lawyering, best lawyering you could buy, creative lawyering, that if they had a, as a news organization, if they had a caption, their website, it would violate CNN's right, First Amendment right of speech, because they would be <laughs> speaking in a way under the Constitution that they otherwise would not choose to speak, if you can imagine that. That somehow, by captioning the website, this was forcing a news organization to speak in a way it not, would not otherwise speak. Now, of course, our position was that, and we had to stick close to this, that it was really a mechanical translation of what was being said, and in no way was it speech. You can imagine the arguments that would go on in the court, could have gone all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. Uh, the, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, the high court, we eventually went up and down. But it, at the end of the story, kind of split the baby because there were some state law problems and there were some First Amendment problems. But essentially, under the First Amendment to the Constitution, in this context, captioning did not violate CNN's free speech. Under California law, it was still problematic for other technical reasons. So we ended up settling the case. Each side was kind of licking their wounds and didn't want to make any really bad precedent. And the law had changed a little bit in any event. You may have heard of the 21st Century uh, Communications and Video Accessibility Act. What is it called? CV, Communications and Video Accessibility Act that's administered by the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. 
Well, while our case was going on, the FCC mandated that captioning was required on the web. So it was a good thing that we had settled. But, but notice again, the pushback disability. And notice again, though, our position on mechanical translation versus a more difficult position, which is the case to come on video description. So for example, if I am here in a museum and I am describing a Picasso, or if I'm talking about, there's, there's actually litigation on this point right now. You know the play Hamilton in New York? Uh, blockbuster hit, sued by the disability community who wants video, who are blind, who want video description, earphones to understand what's going on on the stage in addition to the words. That will be a very interesting fight because to some extent, you might say that's artistic interpretation or that involves some sort of speech, interpretation of what's going on, and maybe you'd have a different result than the mechanical result we had in CNN. But again, all litigation that in reality, in my opinion, and I'm biased, is, a, is not a tempest in a teapot, but it's about things that can be easily resolved at little cost, but for some reason seem to drive beyond what's really going on in terms of the disability situation. Now, I could tell you more and more cases, I, you know, from swimming with the dolphin cases where the dolphin owners in Hawaii didn't want blind people to swim with them because they might hurt the dolphins rather than, you know, somehow maybe let's change the experience and the training a little bit so people can participate um, to exclusions from major corporations. So this is one major area of BBI's interest, trying to unpack in a systematic, rigorous way through science these deep underlying conceptions about disability, whether it's in systems, programs, technology, and, and we have a great team. We've been very fortunate to receive millions of dollars in grants to try to understand these issues. Now, I want to move to another area which will introduce Barry and Laura and others. And this is this fascinating area of supported decision-making, which BBI now has many millions of dollars working on. In the United States and around the world, you know that Historically, there's this concept of guardianship, which means there's a court order, essentially, typically in a probate court, which says that somebody else is going to be making decisions for a ward. That historically has been a, a very common option for people with cognitive disabilities, people as they get older in some ways, but generally, for example, in 1995, there were about 500,000 people under guardianship with cognitive energies and other disabilities. Today, there's about a million and a half. Based on our research and many others, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of work in this field. The conclusion is that oftentimes, very often, guardianship is either unnecessary or unduly burdensome, burdensome in the sense that it really denies the individual the opportunity make decisions that would enhance, enhance their life in terms of quality of life, in terms of health. And many times these decisions are, the guardianship decision is made because of pressure of the system. So for example, kids who maybe are in the special education system, IEPs, the counselors start advising the parents 16, 17 years of age, you better start thinking about guardianship because it's important for you as, you know, and the family as it goes forward. Well, more recently, there's been a push in law and policy, both in the United States and internationally, the, to the sense that, you know, maybe guardianship is appropriate in some circumstances, but certainly it's been overused, and certainly to the detriment of the self-determination of many people. So about four years ago, I get a call from this unbelievable attorney, Jonathan Martinez, who's now the legal director of BBI at the time. He had worked for PNA in Virginia, 
And at the time, he was working for a fantastic organization named Quality Trust for Individuals with Disabilities in uh, Washington, D.C. Jonathan asked if I would uh, come down to Hampton Roads, Virginia, to a courtroom smaller than this courtroom to testify in a case about the research I had been doing on self-determination and related to guardianship and ADA and institutionalization in a case involving a young woman named Jenny Hatch. Jenny, who was at the time about 29 years old, uh, has Down syndrome. Uh, she has a few other disabilities as well. And she, her, her parents decided that they wanted to petition the local court, the probate court, for full guardianship of Jenny at that time. At that time, Jenny had been living independently and with friends. She had a job. She was working. Uh, she had her own cell phone. She arranged for her paratransit. She arranged for her medical situations with advice from friends and was basically living the life she wanted to live. Her parents, for a variety of reasons, and this is not parents versus children, because we get a lot of these cases, well-meaning parents, maybe sometimes overly paternalistic, maybe sometimes have different views than the child does or the, the adult child. Um, the parents wanted to make all the decisions for Jenny. And they received a temporary guardianship order, which placed Jenny in a group home, which took away her cell phone, which uh, allowed her only to see people during certain hours, which took her away from her job, and basically, in her words, made her a prisoner of other people, what they wanted her to do. And Jenny, if you'll meet her, I hope someday, is, does not take this lightly. Jenny uh, said, we're going to court. And she wanted to file a petition to end this guardianship, which resulted in this trial in Little Hampton Roads, Virginia. And for the first time after days of trial and testimony and, and affidavits and reports about inclusion and self-determination, you know, this is all virgin territory. We had never tried a case like this before. Jonathan Martinez, stellar lawyer, was the lead lawyer. He deserves the, really the credit for carrying this forward. Um, the judge decided for the first time in America that he would order a movement for supported decision-making to Jenny, that he would not support the guardianship, and that um, everything was to be done to enhance Jenny's self-determination. That was a great victory, uh, and it immediately became a cause celeb. So much so that my colleagues and I were very fortunate to be part of and receive funding to, to start this thing called the Jenny Hatch Justice Project, JHJP. And that was to spread the word to parents and others about, think about these issues. Think about judges, these issues. Think about school psychologists and counselors. As a result of that, the Administration on Community Living, which is in the HHS, Health and Human Services, uh, put out a call for a proposal to establish the first National Resource Center on Supported Decision Making. Again, we were very fortunate through Quality Trust and its leadership, which had brought the original case, to be a part of that new partnership, which established, you can go to it free online, a national resource center, state-by-state -state analysis, case law, information for parents, information for people, holding local conferences, supporting projects like we do in Kentucky, which Laura will tell you about, across the United States, and generally raising awareness about this issue. You see, by the way, my particular madness, but. This one little case, like Don Perkle, like other cases I've been involved with, really have generated, have helped me to generate, with others, of course, in partnership, these lines of research, which we subsequently examined. So the National Resource Center, uh, again, free of charge, all online, um, has become a great vehicle for sharing information. You'll hear some about that from Laura and Barry today. As a result of that, the United States government, HHS, again, put out a call for research, two and a half million dollars, to study the efficacy. Does supported decision making really work? So far, it's been an advocacy argument and a policy argument, 
and I think somewhat of a science-based argument that people who are more self-determined obviously have a better quality of life. If you make your own decisions generally, even with support, you're bound to have a more vested interest and a better quality of those decisions as opposed to somebody else making those decisions for you. So we were fortunate to win that grant at the Burton Blatt Institute, and we are now working with a cohort in Washington, D.C., 1,000 individuals from which we will randomly select individuals, individuals with developmental disabilities and other conditions, to set up an experimental study where we provide interventions over a five-year period to individuals and then sit back and try to understand whether or not, in fact, peer counseling, family supports, online uh, technology, uh, queries, FAQs, whatever it's called, really enable people to learn how to make decisions more for themselves and the quality of their life as compared to controls, people who are still in guardianship. And um, this is very exciting to us. So again, coming back to my old war stories, case stories, while this is going on and we're doing this, I had a case in Maine, again, which I was asked to talk about research, writings, and experiences with the local PNA, which was fantastic and which involved a woman named Leslie. Leslie uh, has cerebral palsy and is partially deaf. And when she was 18, her parents, her mother primarily, placed her in full guardianship. And she had lived in group homes, really had no say in her life. She was tested when she was 18, uh, IQ of about 47, um, without a sign interpreter. So she was basically tested on the WISC, on the Wexler Intelligence Scale, without a sign interpreter. 30 years later, Leslie wants out. She has a fiance she'd like to see. She'd like to live where she wants to live. She'd like to work. And she'd like to have a life, basically. Now, again, to me, interestingly, the parents say, well, she acts out and she's had some bad choices and behaviors. And what we argued in court was, yeah. I mean, if you were a prisoner for 30 years, wouldn't you try to help self-coping strategies? Nothing violent, nothing harmful. You know, she didn't want to eat what they told her to eat. She didn't want to do what they told her to do. She wanted to do dress how she wanted and so forth in a group home. And so she essentially came to a learned helplessness. You know, the Martin Seligman studies uh, of learned helplessness. I think it's fair to say that there was no opportunity for learning and decision making. So lo and behold, when we had her retested with an accessible IQ score, what do you think happened? Double, 87, 90, no surprise. How can somebody be expected to be tested when we, we also gave her the Vineland? She had very high adaptive behavior skills. You know, smart. I took her out to lunch with friends. She orders from the menu. She goes and does her art. She, she liked to paint. She liked to work. She likes to shop. Um, we settled that case. But once again, it was the first time uh, that Maine had moved towards a conception of self-determination in this area and supported decision making. One last case, uh, and to tell you again how our thinking is driving on this. Ryan King, just last year. Ryan King, African American male who lived in Washington DC with intellectual disability, IQ 50s, low 50s, high adaptive behavior skills. Notice once again that, at least in my world, IQ is the measure of not much with regard to how people, many people with cognitive disabilities are capable of and do live in the community, particularly with supports. Because, you know, as Jonathan Martinez would say, do I know anything about cars or do I ask my auto mechanic? Do I ask my dentist what I should do or my tax accountant? You know, who doesn't have supports of these kinds? So Ryan King um, was under the guardianship of his parents and sister in Washington, D.C. Working independently, high adaptive skills, um, wanting to do his own thing, living independently, and communicating independently. His parents and sister did not want anything to do with guardianship. 
They didn't want to be his guardian. He didn't want them as guardian. The District of Columbia said, well, if you want services, then you need to have a guardian. So think about the pressure there, the perverse incentives and pressures of a system that somehow was supposed to be teaching independence and inclusion at the same time was driving people away from that system. So again, for the first time, to my understanding, in the District of Columbia, we're taking these cases one at a time, we got three so far, um, the court agreed with us. The court terminated his guardianship. The, the services he was to receive were not to be contingent upon that guardianship, which was a bizarre interpretation in any event. And Ryan, he said he was free. He said he was a prisoner before, even though he loved his family. Now, I tell you these illustrations again, once again, because you see the system, you see stigma, you see kind of parental education and preferences, often driving these guardianship determinations without really thinking about the person at the center of this whole situation. <laughs> One last case I'll tell you about, which, which is related to this. And then at some point, we should open it for a discussion. I don't know what time it is. And then I want to give Laura a chance to talk about our partnership on supported decision-making in Kentucky. Um, and uh, Barry to talk about our empirical research as well, if that's okay. Okay, thank you. So that's good, because it's very important that we leave ample time for conversation and discussion, because that's the rich part, really. You don't need me talking at you for too much longer. Um, one more case, well, I was going to do one more case. Um, another case that has kind of driven our thinking with regard to autism. A number of years ago, I was very fortunate, again, I always feel blessed when I'm in some ways approached by these pioneers who I have the luck, the, the fortune to work with on these cases. It's so, so satisfying as a lawyer and as a social scientist and somebody who is personally associated with disability on a family level as well. Monica Heath. Uh, Monica Heath, who really had no money, was in a custody battle with her husband. The case was called Heath versus Heath. Could have been a movie. And um, two kids involved, two young boys, Mike and Sammy. Mike uh, has autism. And Sammy, the younger boy, I believe the name was, today they'd say neurotypical, no, no conditions. Just a kid without autism. Um, they went to family court for a divorce. And the father had just visited with the younger boy without autism alone. And sua sponte, which means on the spot, um, suggested to the family court judge, you know, Sammy's so much better when he's not with Mike, which was really not true. Uh, they loved each other. They wanted to stay together. There were no behavioral issues, nothing out of the ordinary. Um, why don't we cut the family in half? I'll take Sammy, kid without autism. Monica, let her take Mike, split up the family. So, but what was amazing was that the judge on the, almost on the spot without evidence, taking any evidence said, you know, not a bad idea. Let's do it. Uh, split up a family, the boys that really didn't need to and didn't want to, and nobody wanted to except for the husband to be split up, kind of a sad situation. I mean, in our briefs, we would, we would talk about that autism is not the plague. You know, we shouldn't be splitting up kids on the basis of autism, certainly without some sort of evidentiary hearing that went on. There were no issues of bad parenting on either side. But again, like Jenny Hatch, like Don Perkle, again, feeling very blessed to work on these cases, this came, became kind of a cause celeb. The Autistic Society became involved. The local advocacy organizations became involved. This case went up to the California Court of Appeals. And um, at the end of the day, the court ruled in Monica's favor. A, very interestingly, to the court's credit, you know the biblical story of uh, Solomon, who was going to cut the baby in half, and the, mother, the real mother said, no, let her take it because she didn't want to see the baby killed. 
Well, the court, it's an interesting decision, which I'd rec uh, recommend to you, uh, referred to the biblical story of Solomon, but said 